always wanted to voice like the young male shown in Protag. And now I'm like, but maybe what I was meant to voice was Sagavi all along. And I just had it in my head that I needed to voice, you know, like Black Star and Soul Eater. But really, I was able to voice myself in a completely different way in a shonen role. And that's really cool. Hi, this is Sean Gann, Crunchyroll ADR director for such titles as Buddy Daddies, The Apothecary Diaries, and Kaiju Number no. 8. And you're listening to Podcast Across Worlds, Hawaii's number one podcast for anime and manga. Aloha, everybody. I am Lehua Superfina, host of Podcast Across Worlds, where we like to watch a lot of anime read a lot of manga, and talk about it for hours. And today we have the honor of having Marissa Duran as our guest, a non-binary Spanish Caucasian LGBTQIA plus actor and voiceover artist. She has been awarded Best Actress and multiple Best Actress nominations at film festivals across the country. We know Marissa as the voice of Kyoko Hori from Hori Mia, Sagiri, Hell's Paradise, Jasmine St. George from Ancient Mages Bride Season 2, Lulu and Louis from Shadow Spouse, wow. and Hana Ichijo from Aoishi. Welcome to Podcast Across Worlds, Marissa. And yes. hello, doggy. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, no, she's barking because there's people outside. So I was like, she's, she's going to go in the other room now. <laughs> but I love her. She's the best. What's her name? Her name is Nola. And I always thought that it was because it, she was named after New Orleans, Louisiana, because they call it NOLA. No, it's, it turns out it's because she was the color of granola. So oh. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I love it. She's normally very well behaved until she sees people outside and then she is not. Is she like a social dog? Is that why she's like, hey, hey, talk to me. Somewhat. I feel like she's a big chicken, honestly. I think I think she just gets very protective and like scared. So she uh, she starts barking. It's very funny. <laughs> well, welcome to Podcast Across Worlds, Marissa. We're super excited to have you here because there was like a point where I was watching anime and I was just feeling like there's something missing and when Horimiya came on I was like this is it I was missing the wholesome heartwarming shoujo jose slice of life anime and you know what Kyoko is like one of my favorite characters <laughs> she's like so real and she has so many facets to herself I loved it <laughs> And we wanted to get to know you more. So we want to know about your background. Like you began performing with professional theater companies at a very young age. Can you tell us a bit about those early experiences and how they sparked your passion for acting? Yeah, that's such a fun question. I, I have to thank my mom for being the one to get me started. Um, mm -hmm. Growing up, it was like every summer we would look through the newspaper and find different um, summer camps or workshops for me to take. And a lot of times they were sports related or dance related. And then one summer she signed me up for um, like a little three week musical theater variety camp. And it's, I mm -hmm. think it was right before I would be starting second grade. And um, we like wrote our own like little five minute play. And then we learned a bunch of dances to different songs like Twist and Shout was one of them. And then we, of course, put on a little performance at the end for all of the parents to come and watch. And that was what got me started. And it was the one thing I tried that I stuck with for as long as I did. Um, a lot of things I tried, I would do it for a year or two and then be like, well, I don't really like this anymore. Um, but theater and acting was something that I loved and definitely wanted to keep doing. So I then like graduated from that little camp. And then I started working with a company called Plano Children's Theater here in the Dallas area. And I did a ton of shows with them. And my parents even got involved. Um, we would have to like build the sets and stuff. So my parents would come up and help. And then they even ended up being in a show with me, each of them, which is very funny. Um, yeah, it was super cute. And we have pictures of it, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I did a ton of shows with Plano Children's Theater and then did theater in middle school. And then because I had been doing it for so long, I got kind of burned out. And I was like, okay, well, when I start my freshman year of high school, I'm going to do choir and drill team instead. 
So I did. Okay. And then at the end of my freshman year, I was like, man, I really miss theater. So I went back to theater um, <laughs> and did that all through high school. And then by the time my senior year rolled around, I knew that I wanted to get a degree in theater. And fortunately, my parents were very, very welcoming and accepting of that idea. Um, nice. So yeah, I went to TCU in Fort Worth, Texas and got my BFA in acting. And uh, yeah, just just have never stopped. Just keeping the ball rolling. <laughs> and so your background is rooted in theater, but you later transitioned into television and film. Yeah. What drew you towards those different mediums? I enjoy a challenge. And when you're doing theater on the stage, it's it's grounded in realism, but it's still a little bit larger than life, especially if you're performing to a large audience, right? Because you want everyone to see what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And film is the exact opposite of that, where everything is so grounded and so natural that it almost feels like you're not doing anything. And it was hard mm -hmm. for me um, to adjust to that, but I really liked the challenge of learning how to be small and so after spending mm -hmm. so long on the stage. I remember I took a, a workshop with a, a casting director for film and he was like, you blink a lot. And I was like, I didn't know that my eyes are dry. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but it was something that the camera picked up on because it's so up in your face and it was something that you don't pick up on on stage. Um, so I became very um, aware of how much I blink when I'm on camera. Um, but it's interesting. There's so many intricacies and, and subtleties to film and it really does feel like you're not doing anything. Um, I had a, a coach that would be like, okay, let's do less, do less. And I was like, I feel like I'm doing nothing. And he was like, great, then you're doing it right. So it was uh, a, a fun challenge, um, a challenge I still am working on because I have a tendency to be very animated, even just in my everyday life and gestures. So um, learning to tone it down a bit for on camera work is uh, difficult sometimes. <laughs> Would you say it's better to start on stage and then camera or the other way? That is such a good question. I, I feel like in some ways being on stage first helped me because I learned how to analyze a script and like break a scene down into different beats. Um, mm -hmm. I learned a lot about character analysis and how to make bold choices that are still informed by the text. Um, and then I was able to translate that into on camera work, but learning to tone down my own expressions has been difficult. Um, mm. Because I really am an expressive person. I am kind of a louder speaking person. And I don't know if that's because that's who I was since I was little, or if that's something my theater training ingrained in me. Mm. Maybe it would be different if someone on stage, with on stage theater training, isn't as naturally expressive as me because then they would be able to go into the on-camera world and have the necessary acting skills, but also be subtle enough that it's not a problem. Um, mm. So it would it would be interesting to kind of flip it on its head and see what would have happened if I had tried on-camera work first. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like my theater training really helped me in some ways. Uh, it, for me, it looks like going on stage first and then film help because they're asking you to do less, less, less versus if someone did the opposite and they would be asked, okay, do more. And they're like, how much more? I feel like I'm doing more. They're like, more. And exactly. I, I feel like it would be harder because you're putting more effort than you're not used to. Right. And I've <laughs> always heard directors say like, when you're auditioning, like go big or go home because it's easier to pull someone back than it is to ask them to be bigger. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And then you've starred in several short films and earned critical acclaim for your performance in Crude Massacre. How did those experiences prepare you for your voice acting in the anime industry? It's so interesting. Um, I The way that I kind of view it is that my version of voiceover acting is taking what I learned from my own camera work and from my own mm. stage work and kind of blending the two into the best of both worlds. Um, on, Cause on camera work is subtle and more grounded and very cinematic. And we're seeing a lot of 
like video games giving those kinds of performances now, which is cool. Mm. But my on-camera work taught me how to um, enunciate clearly, to speak clearly, um, to speak loudly, or to speak quieter when I need to, depending on the size of the space that we're in. And those are skills that have then transferred over into voiceover because you're speaking into a mic at all times. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are ways to make practical effects. Um, like there was a scene where I was kind of in someone's, like my character was in someone's chest, kind of like confessing. And so Sean Gann, who was my director, was like, pull up, like put your shirt like in front of your mouth so that there's something naturally there to kind of make that sound, that muffled sound. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is so smart. And the mic is right there. So you can be quiet. You can be loud if you need to. The engineer will adjust the gain. But the way that I approach anime is usually from a more grounded and real style of acting. Um, so you'll see me in a lot of slice of life or even the shonen role that I have, which is Sagari in Hell's Paradise. She is very grounded and stoic, right? So I'm not usually the one that's loud and crazy like in one piece. I'm the one that's in the slice of life, the rom-com, the cute kind of sweet shows. Um, and I feel like my on-camera training and my act, my on-stage training has helped me because I'm able to pull what I like from each of those genres and then hone in and focus that in for what I do in voiceover, which is really cool. That's really interesting. You've really explained how how much your experience in acting on the stage and on film influenced your voice acting. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. What initially drew you to voice acting and how did you find your way into working with Funimation and Crunchyroll? It was kind of an accident. <laughs> I was, um, I've always been the theater kid that loved auditioning and I know that gives a lot of people anxiety. So I guess I was kind of the odd ball in the group because I, I loved it. I loved the thrill and the adrenaline rush. So there was um, this thing called the column and it's basically like a, a local email blast that would go out like basically once a week. And they always had oh, nice. an audition blast that would go out. And most of the time it was theater auditions. Um, sometimes there would be like, hey, we have a short film casting call. We're looking for actors. And then one time I checked it and Funimation had actually put in um, an open casting call. And they were just looking for actors. And I didn't know anything about voiceover at the time. So... I sent them an email like they asked and set up like a little 10 minute audition appointment time and then showed up the day of, went in and they had two binders sitting on the counter and one was for male roles and one was for female roles. So I picked up the female roles binder and just picked like three random characters that I was like, sure, I can voice that. Um, Black Star from Soul Eater was one of them, which is very fun. I don't remember the other two, um, but I went into the booth, put on the headset, had them kind of explain what was gonna happen and then I just mm -hmm. read the audition sides and performed them as if I were the character and putting my own take on it. And then I left and I was like, okay, cool. And in theater, if you don't hear anything back within like two weeks, you didn't get cast. Okay. Well, I didn't hear anything for six months and I had completely forgotten I even auditioned. And then all of a sudden I get an email one day and they're like, hey, can you come in and record Walla on the show? And I was like, I don't know what Walla is, but okay. Um, <laughs> So I did. And that was for, it was a show called Showman Sample. That was the first thing I ever worked on. It was in 2015. And I went in with a group of three other film actors and learned very quickly, like what, how it worked and what I needed to do. And I'm very grateful for the three that were in my group. I honestly don't remember who it even was. Um, but they were <laughs> well, great. It was like almost <laughs> 10 years ago. I know. <laughs> But they were so nice and they helped me and um, I felt welcomed, which was wonderful. Mm. And then it was just very sporadic um, for the next couple of years. I'd get called in maybe once every six months, um, but I also wasn't focusing on it. It was just something I got to go do. And then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I started taking voiceover classes in, I think it was 2018. Um, and was like, I really enjoy this. And I think I want to learn more about it, which ended up being a really good thing because then when COVID hit, it was like, I was already prepared to work from home, to record auditions and had a really good understanding of how voiceover worked. So I was mm -hmm. able to transition from doing a lot of theater stuff into doing more voiceover stuff. Um, yeah, it was, 
it was a fun journey. Um, and I, it was kind of a slow journey too, in a way, because I didn't really focus on it for the first several years that I was doing it. And then mm. COVID hit. And then I booked my first lead role in 2021. And that was mm-hmm. Hody and Hody Mia. And so it was, what was that? 2015 to 2021, however many years that is. That's how long I was just like kind of chilling in the ether of the voiceover world um, and learning and cutting my teeth and uh, taking more classes. And then Hody Mia kind of launched my career and I've just yeah. been going with the flow ever since. How did you hear about the voiceover classes? I, that is a good question. I had talked to some folks, I think, up at the studio, up at Funimation at the time, and Mm -hmm. they were kind of giving me some recommendations. And there weren't as many online classes at that time because this was pre-pandemic. And Mm -hmm. so they recommended Sunny Straight Studios. And he had um, a physical location in Denton, Texas, which is like, I don't know, like an hour from me-ish. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for a class through them and Felicia Angel was actually our teacher for that class, even though it was at Sunny's studio. And for three weeks, I would drive up there once a week and we would practice dubbing to picture and Felicia would give us tips on demos and that kind of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. It was great. And then I met people in that class. I think there were maybe six or eight of us. I met people in that class who were taking other classes. And so they would give recommendations So then I took a class with Kyle Phillips in person here in Dallas. um, And that was super helpful. And then I met more people through that class and they were like, oh, you should look into this. And so it just became like word of mouth central. Um, Mm -hmm. People like popping in ideas and studios and me trying to take mental notes and write them down. And um, (laughs) yeah, so, but now there's so many more options. And that's, that was one of the weird blessings about COVID is that everything moved online. And so now Mm -hmm. you had all of these people who had taught for years who were like, hey, you can join us on Zoom or people who hadn't thought to teach until COVID hit who were starting to teach. And Mm -hmm. there there was just a wealth of information available online all of a sudden, and it made it much more accessible for all of us, even people who aren't in a major hub, right? Like suddenly all of this knowledge was at our fingertips. And um, yeah, so it was a blessing in disguise in a weird way, but classes are fabulous and then were there any mentors or role models who influenced your career path in the anime industry that's such a good question i i didn't really start watching anime until i was in college um Mm -hmm. and the first anime i ever watched was soul leader and I loved mm. Brittany Karbowski as Black Star um, because in theater and on camera, the, the way you look, the way you present yourself basically is what you get cast as um, most of the time. And so it can feel like you're put into a box. And watching Soul Eater was incredible because I was like, what do you mean that a femme presenting actor is voicing Black Star? That's a little boy or like a preteen boy. And it doesn't <laughs> have to be a preteen boy voicing him. That's so cool. Um, So it kind of opened my eyes to a different way of how casting could work. And I really liked Mm -hmm. that because I felt like I wasn't going to be put into a box. Um, So Brittany Karbowski is a huge source of inspiration just because she voices so many young boy characters and somehow they all sound different. And I think that's incredible. Um, Gray Delisle as Azula in Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, the scene where she has oh. that, that mental breakdown and like breaks the mirror, that scene kills me every time. And I think it's beautiful. And it it motivated me to pursue anime, but also just animation in general, because it is such a powerful storytelling medium. And for me to want to cry because of something I saw animated, that is incredible. Um, mm. And then another huge mentor for me is Caitlin Glass. Uh, because she is the person that gave me that breakout role that believed in me enough to give me that chance. And now I have a career because of what she helped me do and accomplish. Um, and not only is she an amazing director, she does theater and she's an amazing actor and is giving new people chances all the time. And I, I look up to her tremendously. 
Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> you mentioned so many good people, like iconic, like they have been such prominent figures in the anime industry. Like they are amazing. Yeah. Now with in 2021, you voiced the lead role of Kyoko Hori in Hori Mia. Can you describe the audition process and what resonated with you about Kyoko as a character? Yeah. So I, I always love telling the story because it was so bizarre how it all worked out. Um, we got the auditions, I think it was on a Thursday or a Friday. And I was cat sitting for a friend at their apartment, like 20, 25 minutes from my house. And so I was already there when I got the audition email and I was like, well, I guess I have to go home and record these on my equipment at some point. So <laughs> Sunday night rolls around at like 10 PM and I drive home and I record the auditions and I only auditioned for Hori and for, uh, Sakura Kono. Um, cause those were the mm -hmm. two that I felt like my voice would fit best. I was like, I'm not a Yoshikawa type. Like that's not meh. Um, <laughs> so I recorded those two auditions and sent them in. And uh, I'm trying to think, it was like Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, I get an email and they're like, hey, um, can you come in to record Kyoko Hori with director Caitlin Glass tomorrow? And I was working at Starbucks at the time, so it was slow and I had checked my email and I kind of, I, I couldn't even remember who that character was because I it, it was so like, <laughs> so I Googled it and I was like, oh crap, that's the lead. And then I had to tell my manager and be like, hey, can I go in the back and respond to this email real quick? Because it's very important. Um, and then I had to ask for the next day for someone to cover my shift because I was supposed to work when I needed to go in and record. And it was a whole thing. Oh, um, it was wild. But they did. They were great. They were super chill about it. Um, yeah. So I went in the next day to record and I was just kind of terrified because I had never had any kind of named role at all before. And now suddenly I was the female lead in a show. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I'm prepared to like carry a show in that way i was like i hope i know enough i hope i'm i sound okay like i don't know um <laughs> and i remember when i saw who was going to be cast as who i was completely overwhelmed because i was like kagi films is a guy who has so many followers and like people know him what do you mean i have to act opposite him and at the time he had like eighty thousand twitter followers or something and now it's even more than that but i was like these people are like celebrities in my eyes. Like, what do you mean? Um, which was very funny. Turns out they're all super down to earth and very cool. And now they're all my friends. And I'm like, this is great. But at the time I was uh, terrified um, that the imposter syndrome was very real. Oh. Um, I remember even just trying to say the name Miyamura I had trouble with because Caitlin was like, you need to tap the R. And I was like, I, huh? And so I could say it when I was just saying his name, but if I had to say it in the middle of the line, I would be like, mm -hmm. And oh. it was like a whole thing. And then I was like, I am so bad at this. Um, it got much better as it went on. But mm -hmm. that first episode was hard because I was trying to figure out what Hori needed to sound like. And then I was worried that maybe I wasn't high pitched enough. And then I couldn't really pronounce some of the names because it was my first time hearing them and having to tap an R. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and this was during COVID. So I was all alone in the studio because both our director and engineer were in their houses. So I was just alone with a security guard in this like big warehouse recording place. And was just like, I don't even know what you guys really look like. I'm just here chilling. Um, it, was, it was an interesting experience because it was during COVID. Um, but it was so rewarding and I learned so much. And Caitlin was so patient with me and gave me so many tips and great feedback. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it changed my career path entirely um, because I was suddenly like, okay, I'm doing the dang thing. We're out here. Um, and I'm trying to remember, there was a second part to this question and I don't remember what it was. So what resonated with you about Kyoko as a character? It's so funny. I, I know now that I got cast in this role because I am Hori in so many ways. She's like a slightly exaggerated version of me, but we're pretty similar. Um, even down to the way we look. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> uh, she is stubborn and fiery. She's definitely an Aries. Um, and so am I. And she doesn't want to be vulnerable. And at the same time, when she finds the person she loves, she's like, okay, I can open up to you now. 
Um, mm. She is group mom for sure. She takes care of everything. She cooks, she cleans, and she does it because it's a necessity, but also because she loves those people and she's going to take care of the people she cares about. Mm. Um, she, it, she's very smart and she's well-spoken. Um, I wouldn't mm-hmm. necessarily say that I was as popular as her when I was in high school. Um, <laughs> but we definitely share similar like academic qualities. Um, yeah, there's just, it's, it's amazing when you get cast in a role that essentially feels like the anime version of you and mm-hmm. it could not have worked out any better. I am so glad that the universe decided that that was for me. <laughs> <laughs> and how much time were you given to prep for Hori? It sounds like you only had days. Like you're yeah. given the script, asked to go to the studio, and right then and there, just record. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't even remember if I had watched the first episode by the time I had to go record it. Um, it didn't even occur to me that there was a manga. Like I didn't do any research. I didn't do any. Like. I was Mm. so new to the idea of having any kind of like big role in voiceover that I had, I had never done any kind of research for any of like the background wall of it before. Cause I was like, I'm just here to be filler. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know that people like would commission art of their, I, I mean, I had no idea about any of this. So I went in completely blind essentially for that Mm -hmm. first session um the only things i knew were things that had been mentioned in the sides um so it was kind of comforting to go in and essentially hear like hey welcome um we cast you because you brought something so real and so natural to this role and it just sounded like it was a perfect fit and i was like okay cool so am i supposed to just be myself like i don't know what's happening um (laughs) but essentially i didn't do any prep i I did some vocal warm-ups before I got to the studio, um, mm-hmm. but that was about it. I didn't really look into the story or anything really before I went into it, which I now do not recommend at all. Please, please do some research so you know what you're going into. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that that is how it happened. <laughs> it seemed like Caitlin really gave you great direction and gave you some backstory on Kyoko to prep you for the role. What was that like? So helpful. Um, Because Caitlin was someone I looked up to and I was like, she's voiced some really cool stuff. She's directed really cool stuff. And to be in her presence and not be as intimidated as I thought I would be was very nice. Um, Mm Because the last thing you want when you're going in to record something is to be so nervous because of the director that you can't even do your job well. Mm. Um, Unfortunately, that did not happen, right? Like, I felt very comfortable. She was super patient and forgiving when I made mistakes. And she was like, that's okay. We'll just come in again. Like, it's all good. And then she would be like, hey, um, we got to tap the R on that. And I was like, okay. And she was like, okay, say it like three times in a row. Because just the more I would say it, the better it would get. Mm -hmm. Um, she always just sounded so happy over the mic. Um, Cause again, I couldn't see her. She wasn't there physically. I, all I could hear was her voice. Um, but it was, it was a collaborative effort and she let so much of what you hear was like my interpretation of it. Instead of, you know, being given a line read or a specific way of saying a line, what you're hearing is just me organically in the booth responding to what I was hearing and what I was given. Um, mm. So it was it was a wonderful process, very collaborative. Now you have voiced many characters. How do you approach bringing such a wide range of characters to life? It's interesting because to me, all of my characters sound like me, right? Because I'm so used to hearing my own voice that to me, there's not that much distinction between them all. Um, mm. Someone earlier today put together a compilation video of all of the redheaded characters I've voiced because there's a lot of them. And it was bizarre <laughs> to hear them all kind of like one after another because I was like, I don't know, man, you guys all sound kind of similar to me. Like, I don't think there's that much <laughs> range here. But other people who aren't me are like, your range is incredible. And I'm like, 
I'm not hearing it. What are you talking about? But I genuinely think it's because I'm so used to the sound of my own voice that it doesn't, I don't hear range anymore. I just hear me. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's exciting when people are like, I had no idea that was you. And I was like, well, I did because it sounds like me. Um, (laughs) But I, it's, it's always great when the script adapter writes lines that are different from something I would normally write. Um, there are some mm. adapters who will write lines knowing that I'm voicing this role. And so they write something that I myself would say, which is hilarious and very funny. But there are other script adapters <laughs> who will write things in a way that I would not have thought of. And it allows me to better get into that character's mindset and deliver it as that character would rather than making a choice that I, Marissa, would make. Because um, mm. sometimes that's, that's the trap and the downfall of anime dubbing is we don't see the script until we go in to record. So I literally have 30 seconds while we're watching the original Japanese version to look at the script and be like, okay, this was what was said before me. This is what I'm saying. So I need to emphasize this line or this word so that I'm not repeating exactly what they said and trying to like navigate it all in my head so quickly and spontaneously before I have to record. So a lot of times the choices that I make in the booth, it's easy for me to make a choice Marissa would make rather than a choice Mm -hmm. the character would make because I have so little time. Um, so that's something I'm trying to work on actually. And, and something that will hopefully help me distinguish the characters better because they have different personalities. I know there are a lot of tropes and a lot of stereotypes in the anime that are repeated, uh, especially in the mm-hmm. Isekai world, but those characters still have something different about them. Even if I played something similar before. So it's, it's a fun challenge and a good experiment to kind of explore vocal choices and also, um, cadence and, pitch choices as well Mm -hmm. as just regular delivery and figuring out like this character might emphasize this word instead um so yeah it's there are so many different ways to approach um differentiating characters but i think for me uh vocal dynamics and then um just little personality traits um i Mm -hmm. i myself have a tendency to if I see a line that seems emotional, my I gravitate towards anger. But not every character is going to do that. So sometimes I need mm-hmm. to approach it from frustration or desperation or sadness rather than my go-to being anger. So a lot of it is just breaking out of the mold of what I would do and uh, making it a character choice instead. I want to use Lou and Louise from Shadow's House as an example. They're basically the same person, but they have different personalities. What was it like doing them? It was so bizarre. That was the next char- Those were the next characters that I booked after Hori. And Caitlin was the director again. And uh, when I auditioned, I thought there was no way in heck that that's what I would be cast as. Um, so it was exciting and also very scary <laughs> to be cast as that <laughs> because they were so different from Hori. Um, Lou is very mousy and quiet and she just kind of talks like this. And so there's, there's a flatness to it, but it's not exactly monotone. Everything is just very dry and flat. And then Louise talks like this and everything is very high and mighty. And she's like (laughs) floundering around and floaty. Um, Mm -hmm. and when we got in to record the first episode, um, Caitlin played my audition back for me so that I could listen to each of their voices and we could figure out if that was a good match. Um, and just to remind me vocally of like, how did I achieve that sound again? Um, and so what we would usually do in recording is we would choose either Lou or Louise and do all of their lines and then go back and do the other characters lines. So even if they were flipping back and forth, I wouldn't have to flip back and forth. I could stay consistent with one character for all of their lines. And then we'd Mm. go back and read them. Um, but it was, it was a, such a scary, fun challenge, just like everything in this field is. Um, (laughs) I remember the first episode, especially for Louise, she didn't say a whole lot and I didn't really realize how much she would be saying later on down the road. So vocally, I put her at the top of my vocal register, um, to the point where I was at the ceiling and there was nowhere for her to go if she needed to be bigger or more excited than she was. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of hear a difference between the first episode and every episode after when I realized, oh, she's going to have more to say. And sometimes she's going to be even more animated about it than she was, which means I might have to go higher than I did. 
And if I was already at the ceiling, then I had started too high and I needed to pitch her down a bit. So um, her in the first episode is higher and she kind of stays there. And then for every episode after that, I was like, okay, we got to bring her back down to earth a little bit because that's grading. And I also vocally can't like consistently stay up there because then there's nowhere for her to go. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was a good learning experience for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, uh, a very, again, collaborative effort. And Caitlin was super patient with me. And um, yeah, it was very fun. (laughs) (laughs) And then Sakiri from Hell's Paradise, she has like a more serious, somber, has like a dark backstory. What was it like voicing her? Completely different um, and very hey. exciting. It w- I remember when I watched the trailer in Japanese for Hell's Paradise, I was like, oh, that's cool. She kind of sounds like something I could voice. Never in a million years thought it would be me. Um, and then I didn't even audition for that role. There were no auditions. I just got an email Whoa. that was like, hey, director Mike McFarland is interested in casting you as Sagari in Hell's Paradise. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I know who that is. And so I Googled it and I was like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> and it was my first time to really work with Mike on something more than just like Walla. Um, so I was scared because Mike is like a legend. And I was like, I don't, I've never um I'm just just a little guy um and again it was a very collaborative effort but we both had to figure out how the other person works best um Mm -hmm. and so I was there because there were so many words and names that I was like I'm gonna trip these up I already know that I'm gonna do it um and so he would write it out phonetically for me so that I would remember like okay the emphasis goes on this syllable instead of the one I think it goes on um and so that was helpful for me. Once he knew that I needed mm-hmm. that, he would do it every time. Um, and then I figured out very quickly that like, we both have a very dry sense of humor and he's pretty down to business, right? But he's still fun. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, just because he says that was great, we're moving on, doesn't mean you did a bad job. That just means we need to move on. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and then finally it was like, we both get it now. Like I get the character, you get the character. We're just here having a good time. Um, the first episode was definitely the hardest to record because we were trying to figure out where she sits vocally. And I remember there were lines, I don't even remember which line it was, but there was a line where she's pretty monotone about it. And I delivered it and he was like, I need it to be a little more flat than that. And I was like, okay. So I did it again. He was like, yeah, it's gotta be flatter than that. And I was like, Mike, I don't know how to do that without being boring. Um, And so that was something we had to really work on because I was like, what if she's boring? Like finding the line between boring and stoic is very difficult. Um, Again, a very fun challenge. And I had a great director in Mike to be able to lead me through that process. Um, Mm -hmm. It was also really cool to voice Saturday because she is essentially um, a non-binary coded character. So it's never explicitly stated but because she follows the middle way, um, Genji kind of mentions, you know, you take aspects of male and female and you walk your own path in the middle. Um, and I thought that was super powerful. Um, it's the mm-hmm. first time I'd ever voiced a non-binary char- coded character of any kind. So as a non-binary actor, it was a huge, huge blessing and it meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was a... <sighs> my first ever like shonen pro tag role of any kind and she Mm. is still very stoic and um more chilled out than a lot of folks even gabimaru um but she it was like i always wanted to voice like the young male shonen pro tag and now i'm like but maybe what i was meant to voice was sagari all along and i just had it in my head that i needed to voice you know like black star and soul leader but really, I was able to voice myself in a completely different way in a shonen role. And that's really cool. It was meant to be. That's what I'm saying. Now, yeah. Now, there is the fighting scenes in Hell's Paradise. Did your experience on stage and film help you with voice acting those fight scenes? I think it did. 
Um, and because I do, I have some stage combat experience, but a lot of what I do in the booth is trying to kind of mimic or copy the animation that I'm seeing in my own body. So mm-hmm. if she's got, you know, her sword and she's gearing up for something and it's like swings, I would do that in the booth so that I mm-hmm. could get the breath right. Because if I just stand there and say the line versus if I physically act out the line, my breathing mm-hmm. changes and that changes how the line is delivered. And Mike is also a big proponent of making sure that the efforts and the combat sounds are as similar to the Japanese as they can be. Um, so if there's, I remember there were some we would nitpick because he was like, okay, this one, you're going to breathe in slowly. And then it's a short exhale. So it'd be like, uh, or something very specific. And sometimes he'd be like, okay, I need less voice and more breath. And I'd be like, okay, let me think about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> but we were very detailed and very specific in deliveries, which was really mm-hmm. cool because I am not, I, most of what I do is slice of life, right? So I'm not doing a whole lot mm-hmm. of combat efforts normally. So to have someone patient like Mike guiding me through this process, I learned a lot just about being in a shonen show and delivering combat efforts in a realistic way. Um, so it was really helpful for me. <laughs> Have you encountered any specific challenges or unique experiences as a voice actor? Hmm. I guess I I consider myself an introverted extrovert. So my social battery will be full. And then after a certain amount of social activity, my battery is drained. And I'm like, okay, it's time for me to go home and not be around people for the rest of the day. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and my social batteries... Um, life expectancy changes based on the day and how I feel. So <laughs> the the difficult thing for me currently is when I go to conventions and I'm gone for an entire weekend and my entire day is now me talking to fans, talking to people, having to be social for like, you know, 10 hours at a time. It's hard for me. And I'm, so I'm learning how to um, not close myself off and to not become mm-hmm. Um, short and like um, snarky with people because this may be the one chance they have to meet me and I don't want to be rude and I don't want Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. them to think that I'm quiet and like cold and reserved. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm learning to kind of like recharge my battery through other means rather than trying to self isolate. I'll be like, okay, I need to get up and go get a snack or I'll just Mm -hmm. sit there and talk to my handler and be like, Hey, I need a break for a minute. Um, So I think a lot of the challenges that I face currently are me learning my own limitations and finding um, a healthy like life work balance Um, because that's not something I really had to like deal with before in the past. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So can you walk us through your typical process for preparing for a voice acting role? Yeah. It's it's crazy because in anime specifically, the turnaround time is so fast. Um, so most of the time, I'm not going to have the chance to read an entire 13 volumes of manga before I record the first episode. Mm-hmm. But what I will do is go online and look up um, what the, you know, is there a manga? Is there a light novel? Where can I find it? Um, is it available to read online? Um, do I need the physical versions? And then I will read um, plot synopses. Um, Mm -hmm. I will read different reviews. Like if people on Reddit have like started a thread about um, the show or like a particular character, I'll go read it just to see what people are Mm -hmm. saying. Um, And then I will listen to the trailers or any um, character PVs that are out um, just to get a sound, a taste of what they sound like. Um, Because I know that a lot of, directors in particular really like when the English voice sounds at least similar to the original Japanese. Um, Mm. So I try to kind of get that in my head and listen to the original so that I I know, like, at least in my voice where I think that would sit. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I will just wait until the session and then see what feedback the director gives me. Most of the time they will play back my audition. Um, because I was cast because they liked what they heard. Um, Mm. So that way I can remember vocally what I did and then we can kind of adapt and mold as needed. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's mainly how I prepare. And I always have water with me. Always. I got to stay hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> and then voice acting often involves collaboration with directors and other actors. Can you share some insights into this collaborative aspect of, or in the industry? Absolutely. Um, the one wild thing about anime is that most of the time you are like, if you're recording for a named role, you're not going to be recording with other people who are in the scene with you. Um, so for Hody Mia, for example, I believe what they did is they had Alejandro record first because they knew that I was the newbie and he was the veteran. And so hmm. I needed to have something to react to because it makes it easier. So he would mm -hmm. record all of his lines first, which meant that when I went in to record, I had him to listen and react to. But as we got further in the series, sometimes I would be the person recording first and I would have to lay mm -hmm. down my track thinking about how he might deliver the lines in between so that it sounded more natural. Mm -hmm. um, so our collaborative effort in voiceover is different, especially in anime, because we're not all in the same room at the same time bouncing off of each other. We're mm -hmm. recording separately. It's pretty isolated. Um, and it's up to the director to really make it cohesive and make sure that the lines in between are all matching up and that they sound mm -hmm. like a fluid conversation. Um, so yeah, it's, but it's so fun, especially when you have a bigger role, you're there for more time. So you're able to really sink your teeth into like, I think they would deliver it this way. And the director might be like, well, I like that, but I also think we could do it this way. And so you might have multiple different versions of one line. And then it's up to the director to decide which one they want to use, which is cool. Cause then you listen back and you're like, oh, that's the one they went with. Um, and even, I mean, with the actors, it's hard because we, we are kind of isolated. We're not recording at the same time, but Alejandro and I in particular have worked together enough now that we know how the other person's gonna deliver a line most of the time. Um, hmm. So that kind of helps us because we have that camaraderie, we have that connection and it's like, okay, I know how to deliver this because I can hear in my head how you would deliver yours. Um, hmm. It's not like that with everyone. Um, and you know, it is different if you're called in for Walla, which is background voices, because you're usually gonna have three or four people in the booth actually with you so that you re can record crowd noises and background noises and carry on little conversations with each other and that's mm. fun because that's something you don't get to do when you're a named role. You're just in there by yourself. Um, so I love those moments because you can improvise entire scenes and make silly choices and um, really connect with your fellow actors in a way that you don't always get to. It's very fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then looking back on your voice acting career so far, are there any specific roles or projects that stand out as particularly rewarding? Mm, man, I will always say Hori and Hori Nia because that was, it catapulted my career to new heights. And I learned so much about voice acting and just about myself. Um, mm -hmm. And it helped me connect with Caitlin too, which was really special. Um, voicing Konishi in The World Ends With You, the animation was a cool challenge. It was my first villain. Um, she sat a little lower in my voice and I recorded it from home. So it was the first time I really got to like be my own engineer and figure out how it works to record remotely. Um, oh. So not only was I having to like match flaps, look at the screen, look at the script, but I was also having to adjust my game as we went and make sure I wasn't too loud or wasn't too soft. Um, so that was really neat. Um, and Sagadi is also up there just because I had the opportunity to voice a character who is stoic and learning how to balance that fine line between boring and uh flattened was uh, <laughs> a good challenge and um it was also my first real shonen role which was very special because that was something i had on my little bucket list that i then got to check off um but every role i play i find something to connect to about it or i learn something new um because i'm never done learning right even if i'm not in class anytime i step in the booth i'm there to play I'm there to tell a story and I'm there to learn. And I'm grateful for every opportunity I get to hop in that little booth and record my heart out. So you mentioned that you had to record 
at home and you were learning how were how did you do the recording yourself did they give you some instructions did you did they give you feedback were they with you when you were recording they say oh you need to like do the game you need to do this you need to do that what was that process like it was wild i so i would have both the director and the engineer on source connect um and so they essentially the engineer was connected to my computer and was able to record all of my sound through source connect but I was the one having to engineer it because he couldn't adjust my interface from his place. So he could tell me if we had peaked and something was too loud and then we'd have to go back and mm -hmm. record it. So I would know to turn it back down. Um, and the director would be giving me feedback and be like, okay, let's make this line a little different. Um, and then we would do it again. And I was usually always recording a backup on my end as well. So that if something happened in the source connect session and there was like a little blip or if something weird happened in the connection during a line, they could just pull mm -hmm. from the file that I recorded and it was saved that way. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it was an experience. Um, and it, it taught me a lot about my own equipment, how to use it, what levels I normally sit at, um, and also just how to communicate effectively with a director and an engineer while also trying to act and juggle lines and the technical aspects and it was just it was a lot but i felt so much more calm after you know 12 weeks of doing that and i was like yeah okay mm -hmm. we're groovy now we're cool <laughs> you're like ready for any situation if there's another pandemic ready <laughs> 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 knock on wood <laughs> and did they provide you with the interface or did you already have that i already had it so i started making upgrades when COVID hit um, there were actually some episodes of Hodinia that I recorded from home and my setup was not good at the time. It was during the ice storm in 2021. So I physically couldn't get to the studio, but we still needed to turn in anime episodes. So I used my little setup and then those episodes, I think there were like three episodes. They went to broadcast and then eventually they were like, Hey, um, so the audio quality on those really wasn't up to snuff. And so we need to re-record them, but we need you to come in studio to do that. So originally, the three episodes I recorded from home for Hodinia made it out there, but they were like, hey, mm. we can't keep them this way. So I had to go back into the studio and we spent like seven hours one day re-recording those three episodes, um, mm. which was wild, which also taught me, hey, maybe my booth isn't as good as I thought it was. And then I made a lot of upgrades, added more foam, like did the whole thing. Now it's great. But yeah, <laughs> yes. that taught me a lot. <laughs> and then... Do you have any dream roles or aspirations for the future of your voice acting career? Oh, man. So I love anime because that's what I got started in. And I love that you get to be with a character for at least 12 episodes, maybe more if you get another season. And mm -hmm. so the storytelling, you know, you're not just there for two hours for a video game session, recording a bunch of efforts. And then it's like, okay, I'm done. This has been fun. Like anime... I feel like there's more consistency with it and you get to really follow and grow with the character. Mm -hmm. But I also love video games. And so something I've been telling myself this year is that that's what I want to focus on. I want to focus on auditioning for and booking more video games. Mm. Um, I love that they're so grounded and cinematic. Like I think of The Last of Us um, and, and there are just so many other games coming out now where the acting is front and center. And I'm like, I miss that. Like I miss storytelling that's nuanced and subtle and I love anime and I love how silly and ridiculous it can be, mm -hmm. but I really, I really want to sink my teeth into a role that's really grounded. Um, that, that feels like a film role. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, hopefully video games, um, that's something I'm trying to focus on. Um, I'm going to keep doing anime. Um, yeah, those are, those are, I guess like the two big things right now. Whoa, you know, I, I really like that you want to do voiceover for games because I'm also a gamer. I like to play a lot of video games. I like to play a, a lot of RPGs that have like a very layered story and that will make me cry at the end. So yep. I'm with you. I'm like rooting for you on that. <laughs> Yay, thank you. I need it. 
And then as someone who has successfully transitioned from theater to voice acting, what advice would you give to an aspiring voice actor who is just starting out? Ooh. Um, if you are able to take an acting class or a theater class or an improvisation class, jump on it. Um, that is how you build the foundation for what you will end up doing in voiceover. I, I know so many people are like, I do a really good impression of Bugs Bunny. And I'm like, that's awesome. But who are you and what do you bring to the table? Because that's what they want to cast. They don't want another Bugs Bunny. They want you and they want to know what mm -hmm. you do. Um, so getting your theater training, but also learning your vocal type and your uh, acting type, like what kind of characters you usually play is gonna be so helpful and instrumental in knowing what to audition for and the kind of roles that you're gonna end up playing. Um, there it's impressions are awesome and like so fun to do and there will, will be times when maybe a voice match is needed and maybe your impression is like the thing that gets you cast but it's also voice acting and so having that acting background and that training is going to help you in the long run because mm. they're looking for actors like people who can perform honestly experience emotions honestly and portray them honestly without putting up a mask and hiding behind it um so i even recommend going to therapy because um that helped me like be able to understand my emotions why i feel what i feel and then i can translate that into my work which is really really powerful and i think that's why people connect with my work because there's something honest about it that they can connect to um mm -hmm. take classes keep training um believe in yourself and know that you have a place in this industry even if you don't know where that place is yet and uh, yeah it'll all come together it will oh that was beautiful and i like the therapy part that's very insightful it's like you, you need to know yourself first before you can portray other parts of yourself yes <laughs> yep exactly and then you did mention you do conventions. How can people find you and know about your conventions? Like what social media platforms can people find you? Excellent question. Um, so I am on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. I still call it Twitter. Mm. Um, I am at Marissa Duran underscore. And then I'm also on Instagram at Marissa Duran, no underscore. And then you can always find updates on my website as well. That's marissa-duran.com. Um, there's a little voiceover tab. And at the very bottom of the page, there will be convention updates when I have them. And of course, I'll share about it on social media too. But that's where you can find me. And everyone who's listening or watching, I'll have all of those uh, handle names and links in the description. You can find them in whatever platform you're listening or watching this episode. And I just want to tell you, Marissa, mahalo nui loa for being a guest on Podcasts Across Worlds, taking your time, your fabulous energy, wonderful insights, experiences, information in the anime industry. They're just so valuable. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you we for all having me. Love it. And everybody who's listening to Podcasts Across Worlds, Please send out a mahalo nui lo to Marissa Duran and keep watching anime, keep reading manga, and keep listening to podcasts across worlds. We'll see you on the next one. Ahoy ho. Thank you for listening to Podcasts Across Worlds. This is a passion project that was created by Lehua Superfina and is co-hosted by myself, Mikhail Casanova. If you enjoyed this episode and any of the topics that we talk about or any of the guests and voice actors and various people we have on the show, then make sure you do us a solid by, if you're watching it on YouTube, which is on youtube.com slash Superfina, 
then make sure you like the video, share it around with someone you think would enjoy it, as well as leave a comment on what you think could be improved or what you liked, what you didn't like, and all that in between. If you're listening to the show on any of the major podcasting outlets, such as Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any of the others, then make sure you leave a rating, leave a comment, interact with the polls that we put out, and so much more. If you want to support the show, we do have Patreon, as well as many other methods for supporting. And with that being said, we're signing out. We hope you enjoyed this, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Keep listening, keep watching, and keep enjoying podcasts across worlds. We'll see you around.